And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight from Evil Genius Games, and one of the developers of Everyday Heroes, the successor to the venerated D20 Modern, the one and only Siegfried Trent. No Roy jokes, please. <laughs> Greetings, everybody, and thanks for inviting me to the altar here. Uh, nice cathedral you got. Yep. Uh, just make just make sure to stay away from my from my drinks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Hands off. Because. Well, the, la the last time somebody di last time somebody did that, we had to we had to we had to put we had to put him in the cold tub just to get just to get him awake. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm not much of a drinker, so it should be all right. I've got a, a nice mug of tea here. Yeah. I like tea. Oh, the sole the sole reason I the sole reason I I can I was the one, I was the one coffee drinker in my office who who <laughs> or the one tea drinker in my office. Everybody else would drink coffee. Oh. Yeah, been there many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Although, I've n although I've never, I've never understood the idea of putting of putting cr of putting creamer in tea. Yeah, it's a very English thing. Um, I I I will admit that uh, mine is a bit creamed here. Mm -hmm. oh. so let me start at the humble beginnings, as I often do around here. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Mm, okay, well, let's see. I think you have to go back. My father used to read Lord of the Rings to me when I was a boy. So, as bedtime stories and stuff. So, The Hobbit first, and then Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And I always liked fairy tales, uh, you know, German fairy tales, and um, kind of, you know, the old school stuff, which is pretty hardcore, right? It can be kind of violent, but it's got a lot of imagination and fantasy to it. So, I grew up being surrounded by images and stories of fantasy and the fantastical. So... When I was in, I want to say, eighth grade or seventh grade, my grandparents bought me the the red box D and D set and sent it to me. I was in Seattle at the time, and most of my family was in Alaska. But I spent the summer looking at this thing, going, "This looks amazing." I don't know what it is. I don't understand what you do with it, but I love it, right? <laughs> like, so I knew whatever this game was, I really wanted to play it. It was not clear to me, you know, like I had never seen a role-playing game, never heard of a role-playing game, and I had just got the box. And, and let me tell you, it was kind of indecipherable at the time. I wasn't sure what you were supposed to do with it exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I got that there was a game and the numbers and things, you know, I'd played some war games before, but it was kind of a mystery. But then when I got back to Alaska, it so happened one of my neighbors saw my D and D thing. And he's like, Oh, you play D and D. And I was like, well, I'd like to. And, uh, he had already been playing. So, uh, jumped in and played with him and some other friends that we got together and kind of the rest is history as far as that goes. So I immediately, you know, once I understood what the, how this game worked, I went berserk and I ran games for all my friends and I would make little supplements and I would read dragon magazine and the whole nine yards. It sounds, to, it sounds to me like you fell into the trap of being the forever DM. Uh, I guess so. Like, I do play sometimes. I have friends who are game master. Like, my regular group these days um, is a bunch of game designers for the most part, and we all rotate around. So I was running most recently because I wanted to have them play Everyday Heroes to help play test. Um, but uh, we switch around, and, and different folks will run games for us. Mm -hmm. Which is great, by the way. Yeah, it's nice to be able to take a break, but then get back to it. I mean, if you're a game master, you love to game master, but it is nice occasionally to take a break because it's a lot of work as well. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, ah, uh, since every day since everyday heroes is essentially in intended to be a successor to D twenty modern, how did was it was it in a, was it a case where you approached um, Evil Genius about it, or was it was it something that you that you got tapped for to work on? 
Yeah, the latter. So uh, Dave Scott, who is the owner of Evil Genius Games, mm -hmm. um, actually, he came first to my friend Jeff Grubb, uh, because Jeff's famous and he worked on uh, D20 Modern. And uh, Jeff was very busy and couldn't work on it. And it didn't, I knew Dave from Amazon where they worked together, but uh, didn't know him super well. So he asked around among uh, his friends, his designer friends, and uh, I had just recovered from leukemia last year and wasn't doing anything. Normally I was a software engineer and I spent some time kind of traveling around the world, but then I got really sick and uh, kind of, you know, my whole life gets put on hold. And then this opportunity comes up just as I'm recovering and looking for something to do. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And, um, you know, if you po point me in the right direction, I will go berserk on this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, just watch out. Uh, so that's, and he was looking to get it done in a really short time. So um, he, you know, we talked a little bit and he decided he was comfortable enough to, to give me the go. And so, yeah, I just hit the ground running and I'm like, all right, I'm making this game. So the game is Dave's vision. Like he's the one that said, I want a successor to D20 Modern. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have these movie licenses, which at the time was kind of a secret. Um, and so I need you to make a game that can do all kinds of different movies but is also true to the kind of spirit of D20 Modern, but it has to be a 5e rule set. And I like to have some parameters to work with as a game designer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was nice to have a few borders, and I just uh, got going with that. I, I set up a few movies in mind as kind of a design principle, and we just started going. And then so, yeah, I do a lot of design work. Dave, because it's his vision, likes to come in and make sure that things are staying on the track that he wants them to. And then we got another designer uh, who goes by Goober mm -hmm. and uh, they're great. So uh, the two of us work together to do most of the writing, but we have a lot of advice from like Jeff Grubb who's you know, one of the principals on D20 modern and Stan Brown, uh, who's our producer who also just, you know, they're both veterans of the industry and they help keep us on track. I've been designing a long time, but I am not a big marquee name game designer in the past. Um, I have all these friends who are, but I usually was a software engineer. It's just kind of was mm -hmm. my profession was. So you're familiar with, so you're probably familiar on some level with the coders drinking song. Maybe, I don't know. Like, you know, different, you know, every different company has their own culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, well, it's not, a, it's, it's, just, it's a running, it's a running gag that myself, that myself and some of the friends I have who do, who do code have utilized the whole um, 99 bugs in the code. Oh, okay. I haven't heard that, but I immediately go, oh, yeah, okay. 99 little bugs in the code. 99 bugs in the code. You take one down, you patch it around. 287 bugs in the code. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, and you know, in, in software engineering, there are some late, long nights. And, and uh, I did work places. We had a kegerator at one place I worked, so people would drink. I'm not much of a drinker. I would usually have one drink. Uh, but uh, some folks would get pretty smashed and, mm. and have to wake up in the morning in the office. So, yeah, I um, I would I would always I would always I would I had a tradition of finding the coder and buying him a sandwich, um, as as my as my icebreaker, because I figure because yeah. I figure if if a day if a day comes where that where that guy, where that guy loses his mind. Um, he's gonna remember that I he remember that I bought him lunch a few times, and he's gonna leave me alone. <laughs> Probably so. Although you know, most of us software engineers are pretty harmless folk. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It is true, but everyone has their breaking point. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, we get tested a lot. Uh, you know, that can happen. And ju and just de just dealing with code is enough to drive lesser men crazy. Can be. Can be. It takes a certain kind of thinking. Although I'll say, like, um, you know, I've never worked harder than I worked on on this game on Everyday Heroes, right? Like, because I have, you know, 20, 30 years of pent up passion. Uh, and so it's very easy to work until 4 or 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, night after night. I do keep a pretty kind of late schedule normally, but. Um, when you know when you're just so excited to be doing something right and then like you write something and you're like oh my god i love this and then you just keep going so i i can't say that used to happen when i was a software engineer like sometimes every once in a while i get really excited about the work but yeah um uh, not as much but uh so 
Yeah, but it reminds me of what I saw other software engineers sometimes do. Uh, and I was like, man, you're going to burn out. Don't, don't go so hard. Like, get some rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, give myself that advice. But I tell you, when you're really into it and you're really having fun, it's pretty easy to do. And it's just kind of what you want to do. I mean, otherwise, I'd play a video game or something. But I'm having just as much fun doing this, so might as well mm -hmm. keep going. Yeah. Now, one of the... Now, when it comes to D20... When it comes to something like D20 Modern, which is certainly something that I have a, that I have a soft spot for. Let's, I think we first need to talk about how, how classes are going to work. Um, sure. Now, it ha now D20 Modern had had a lot of things revolve around six classes, and then and then the whole thing with advanced and, presti and prestige. So, one thing I'm curious about is if is that six that six class structure each of them kind of leaning into one of the six ability scores, is that maintained with everyday heroes? Yeah, kind of. Um, so the mechanically it's different, but thematically it's the same. So we do have what we're calling archetypes. We've changed the name of these things a bunch of times. So it's been class, base class, and now it's archetype. Mm -hmm. And that'll be what's in the, in the final product we ended up agreeing to. All right, so we have these six archetypes, which are based on the ability scores. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong hero, an agile hero, a tough hero, smart hero, wise hero, and charming hero. Mm -hmm. um, so these archetypes look like a class. There's a bi-level chart, and they get certain features. Uh, the, the heroes get certain features from their archetype. Their hit dice are determined by the archetype. Mm -hmm. uh, also, their defense formula. So each of these archetypes has a different way to calculate defense, which is kind of our version of armor class. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't involve armor, however. Um, but so the strong hero, their defense is based on their strength. They're, we call it the meat castle, right? They're big, mm -hmm. tough bastards, right? Um, and as where the smart hero, oh, what's theirs called? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, the charming hero is not in the face, right? So mm -hmm. their defense is they're so pretty, you kind of don't want to hit them. And they're very good at whinging and uh, running away. So... So each hero of the archetype is going to have their defense based on their primary ability score. Mm -hmm. uh, and this helps us get away from decks being the uber stat, right? So if I want to be a charming guy, I'm a charming guy. And I can use charisma for a lot more than other people can. Um, you also get a, a progression of feats. Uh, so the feats come off of the archetype. Uh, those are kind of core in our system. And then there'll be a couple core abilities that start out in the class. Strong, agile, and tough have kind of generic ones themed on those three things. So the tough guys are tough, the agile guys are fast, and the strong guys hit hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the smart hero, wise hero, and charming hero each have a kind of resource pool. They each have a different one. The charming heroes have genius points, the wise heroes have focus points, and the charming heroes have influence dice. Uh, but they, they function in a similar way, but each is a unique. And um, that sets the tone for the classes, which then sit on top of each of these archetypes. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, under the strong hero, uh, we designed the brute, these big kind of punchy beat chairs over people, kind of brawly fighter. Mm -hmm. Then there's the MMA fighter, which is kind of a combination of a boxer and a wrestler. So they have unarmed moves, but they're much more in controlling opponents and being strategic. And then we have the heavy, which is like the guy with the giant helicopter machine gun tucked under his arm and throwing grenades and explosions and stuff, right? So these are all strong heroes. They can all use the strong archetype powers, but they also each have their own progression of, we call them talents, that they get um, as they level up. And those are much more specialized than you're going to find in the archetype list. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're first level, you might be a strong heavy, right? And so you're both of these things, and both of those things have, from level 1 to level 10, a progression. Uh, so it's kind of like the advanced classes you get yeah. at level 1, right? And they just bake in there. And um, as, an, as an aside, you have no idea how happy it makes me to see, to see a proper feat system, because that, that was one of my... Um, that's always been one. That's always been one of my issues with, with D, with five E. And when I when I first heard about this, and I thought, wait, how are they how are they going to customize with so, with such a limited feet pool as that five E has? 
Mm, yeah. Oh. It's... Yeah, and I love feats. Like my design claim to fame when the D twenty uh, when the OGL and the D twenty license first came out, I was super excited about that as an amateur designer. Mm -hmm. Right, I was like, ah, I can publish stuff officially now. That's amazing. Yeah, and I, I teamed up with a group of people called the Nepoca Feats, which eventually I became the editor and kind of chief on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it was all about people doing homebrew feats, and then we would edit them as a as a board, kind of the the, the feat board, and mm -hmm. uh, then publish them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had thousands of these things. So my kind of claim to fame is about feats and designing feats uh, going way back. So, yeah, of course, I was like, feats need to be a core part of the system. No more of that optional nonsense. Right. And I, and I know that I know that there's I know that there's the argument that feet that feats in three in three E three E and subsequently D20 modern got to got to got to cr got too crunchy or too, or or too complicated. Um, right. I, I have I have argued that that's it, that that that's an issue of implementation, not an issue with the concept itself. The, yeah, I agree absolutely. The big the big problem with the big problem with feats, um, is that is that. Well, and the especially in the early days, there was a whole lot of there was a whole lot of traps, um, and a whole lot of pay to not suck. Right. The the um, big whipping boy that I've that I've used for years and will probably continue to use until someone pays me to stop. Spoiler alert: You can't pay me enough to make me stop. Is whirlwind attack, and the sheer amount right. of prerequisites you needed for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the prerequisites really do add the cost. I mean, I was always of a of a mind, and Wizards was at one time too, not to have you know to try to minimize prerequisites because um, they they limit your freedom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so. I don't have, well, we, uh, it's a complicated subject, but uh, we have prerequisites, but only for what we call multi-class feats, um, which are based on classes and therefore have a progression like a, like a class does. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, the rest of our feats uh, don't have prerequisites because, not because you can't, I didn't say in the rule book, no feats can have prerequisites, but to set a design philosophy, uh, I didn't do it because generally th speaking, I like them to be um, open and accessible to the maximum number of people because the goal is to have them as a customizing element, mm -hmm. not as an alternative to class, right? Yeah, when I, looked at, when I looked into some of the preview documents, I saw mention of the choice between either a major feat or two minors. Um, right. What is, what is the dividing line between major and minor, um, thematically yeah. speaking? Yeah, thematically speaking, so this kind of comes from 5th edition uh, Wizards implementation, right? So they had a lot of feats that would have, you get plus one to strength and this other stuff, right? Some, uh, what we call a feature or a talent. Um, and it was an awkward system. And it was done because some of the feats were better than others, right? So some feats were great, they were very powerful, and they didn't have a, an ability score bonus. And some feats were a little weaker, so they would slap an ability score bonus that was themed to the feat. But the problem is, is like if you've already got 20 strength, why do you want to take this feat with a plus one strength? You're not going to get anything from it. Um, or you're going to take a feat and it gives you plus one wisdom and you could care less about that. So it's not really serving as a balancing mechanic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea comes from Goober and he published a, a, a rule <laughs> supplement called Half Feats, which basically chops out the ability score thing and says you can take two half feats or one regular feat. I didn't like the name half feet so much, but I thought the design idea was really good. Uh, I had to think about it a little bit. I always have to take a little time to be convinced of something, but I actually thought it was brilliant once I, I thought about it. So what we did is, yeah, we made two kinds of feats. We took out that ability score. There is a feat in our game uh, where you can just take plus one to one of your ability scores uh, up to a maximum of 20. And you can take it whenever you can take, it's a minor feat. So you can take it twice so that you could get the same plus two that you could get from, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons if, if you want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also take that and then another minor feat. So you can mix and match. So I take my plus one strength and then I take any number of these minor feats. Most of our feats are minor feats. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few, though, but if it's something's really powerful, then we call it a major feat. And so then it does something more significant or it's more powerful in combat. And so it needs a little bit more balance. Um, so, yeah, so we have these two. We don't have a lot of major feats 
until you get into the multi-class feats, which are all major feats, because they're granting you multiple class uh, talents. And that's pretty powerful usually, and so those are all major feats. Mm -hmm. And one thing to speak to as far as the complexity, we also, for that reason, divided feats into what we call basic feats and advanced feats. And there's no mechanical difference, but there's a thematic difference. And it's there to signal to new players. So basic feats include plus one to ability score, learn two new skill proficiencies, learn a skill expertise, um, get a, uh, a proficiency on a saving throw, uh, increase your wealth level. They're very basic things. They're not like thematic, cool, like flavorful things. They're just basic changes you want to make to your character to give them basic abilities that you want to cross over that weren't quite in the theme of your class and profession, right? So they're there to round out your character, to build up your ability scores. And so those... Uh, are called basic feats and they're there you know for a new player there's six of them mm -hmm. if they don't want to read the list of 100 plus feats that we have well they could just look at those six and go yeah i would like this you know i would like uh plus one to my constitution so i get more hit points i would like plus one to my strength so i can hit people harder mm -hmm. um and so it's really nice and simple so if a player is new and the feat list is intimidating they could just look at these six options pick something it will help your character right it will be something useful to you uh, and and go with that, mm. or you could dive into the advanced feats, and you know there's more than a hundred of those to customize your character in all kinds of wild ways. Some of them are pretty complicated, mm. some of them are fairly simple, but they're all unique. And then also basic feats, by definition, you can take more than once. You can take ability score training many many times. Mm. You can take skill training many many times. Um, as where the advanced feats are unique abilities, you only take them once, and you'd probably only want to. Mm -hmm. um, that's another reason splitting out the ability score bonuses from those smaller feats is a great design element, right? Because <clears throat> uh, it really lets you, 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 there's no reason you would ever want to take many of those feats more than once, right? It just mm -hmm. wouldn't make any logical sense. But if you wanted the ability score bonus, well, we just give you a different way to do that. Yeah. And... With that, with that in mind, there's there's a few um, there's a few bullet points from the D, from the D twenty modern days, which I'm curious if you if you guys are tr are going to try and integrate into yeah. e into everyday heroes. So let me start with one of the bigger ones. Do you have an equivalent to action points from the OG? Yeah, we don't really. Um, it wasn't something that we decided to bring in. Just because, um, you know, mechanically, we're a fifth a 5e game, right? Mm -hmm. Thematically, we're a D20 modern game. That makes sense. Okay. So the mechanical base was 5e. The thematic base is D20 modern. All right. Um, what about the wealth check? Yeah, there's no wealth checks. Uh, I didn't like that mechanic very much. Neither did anybody else on the design team. No, no disrespect to the people who designed it, right? But it just it's a matter of taste. Um, I thought that in the age of Amazon, uh, wealth should be really simplified. Uh, and so what we do is, is characters have a wealth level, which is based on your profession choice. <clears throat> and there's a little balancing mechanic. So if you're very wealthy to start with, you get a little bit less of uh, proficiencies and ability score bonuses. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and if you have, say, let's say a wealth level of three, you can own or buy any item that is listed with a price level of three or less. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, right? That if we don't, you don't have to keep track. You want to buy a hundred cell phones, whatever. You have a hundred cell phones. I don't care, right? Like if that's how you like to spend your money. So it's basically kind of saying, what's your socioeconomic level? You can buy and have anything because you probably, you know, we all have houses or apartments full of stuff already. So who's to say I didn't already own that? I'm not going to write down everything I own on my character sheet. It'd be insane, right? So you just like, this is your socioeconomic level. We just assume that you have access to things that the, that that are typical for that level. If you want to go above that, um, then it's mostly a matter of working it out with your game master, right? You're like, yeah, I want to save up to buy something. And the game master goes, okay, well, I'm going to say it's going to take you four months. Or if you complete this job, you'll have enough money. You can buy an item that that's price level four right so you just kind of let them 
work that out if there's some deviation. But as as a baseline, yeah, this is your wealth level. You can afford the items in the equipment list that have that wealth level or lower. And if you're not sure, go look it up on Amazon, see how much it costs, right? <laughs> Decide as a middle income person, is that something I could normally buy? Mm -hmm. That's that. Nice and simple. We don't really want it to be involved in gameplay all that often. But there are occasions where, uh, you know, money can be real power. And so there are mechanics in the game that are a little bit based on wealth level. There's a feat called whale, mm -hmm. and it lets you use your wealth level to intimidate people, basically, or mm -hmm. win social challenges. And um, there's a, a power called cha-ching that the, that the hackers have that basically lets them use fake credit card numbers and things like that to buy things they normally couldn't afford. Um, so, you know, so we try to recognize that wealth can be power and we don't, we don't allow starting characters to have a wealth level of six, which would represent like Bill Gates or um, Elon Musk or something. Right. So that would be really game distorting when you, I just, well, I just buy the evil company, right? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Look, you're just going to shortcut everything with that amount of money. So, you can be a multimillionaire. You can be really rich, but you can't quite be. I own the world, rich. Yeah. Um. Now, that be that being said. That being said, um. I was going to ask about occupation, but it looks like we've already get we've already got that. <laughs> yeah, Morris. We have a profession system. Mm -hmm. um, when you build a character, you pick a background, you pick a profession, you pick a archetype, and you pick a class. Mm -hmm. And the profession gives you your wealth level. It also gives you some ability score increases and some proficiencies, and then some little unique, interesting situational advantage. Usually gives you advantage on some kind of skill check in a given kind of situation. Um, and we have a bunch of those because, you know, there's limited space and so we don't want to just pad things out. They're listed in categories. So you're, you're in the medical field, you're a criminal, you're in the security field, you're a spy of some kind. They're, they're more broad categories and you can choose within that exactly what your job is. Mm -hmm. Now with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, um, I do remember the concept of FX abilities being being taught being tossed about in the d20 modern days and i'm curious if you have any, have anything like that planned yeah so yes and no so that's definitely a departure for us um you know d20 modern hat included settings that included uh, magic and psionics and such mm -hmm. we don't have that and that you know when dave was giving his vision part of his vision was uh not to include that sort of thing um, now, he wasn't against including it down the road, but he didn't want it in the core book. He wanted that set in the real world or in a Hollywood version of the real world. Mm -hmm. And so we abided by that. The, the one exception is in our list of NPCs and monsters, we do have uh, some aliens and some robots and, and zombies. They're kind of fun stuff to shoot at, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the game masters can quickly work in fantastical elements into their game. But what we don't have is like magic for characters um, mm -hmm. or psionics for heroes. So uh, we, however, have gotten lots of requests for that. So we're definitely going to do that. But we don't have concrete plans because it wasn't part of the vision at the beginning. It's something we got as we did playtesting. It was a little too late to change our plans. Um, but we are going to add to our plans. And I'm sure that is the first thing we're going to add mm -hmm. right now. You know, we have an ambitious schedule, uh, and so we're just trying to make sure we take care of what's going to be in the Kickstarter, what's in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the number one mission. But I think mission number one after that is going to be something like Urban Arcana, which seems to be the setting people are most keen on, uh, that we're going to develop ourselves probably with our own IP. We did try to get Bright as one of our movie licenses, but we didn't get it. So um, that was going to be kind of our, our replacement for Urban Arcana, but uh, we didn't get it. Maybe we'll get it next year. You never know. But so we'll probably have to develop something ourselves. And we're also reaching out to third party publishers. If there's somebody who's got a strong vision for a setting uh, and wants to do it using Everyday Heroes, then, hey, um, uh, get in contact with us and uh, we'll see if, if that's something we could do. So it, we're thinking about it, but we don't have what I'd call hard plans. So I couldn't tell you anything about what we will do because we haven't done anything yet. Mm -hmm. um, but so many people have asked for it that it's coming, for sure. Yeah, and in that, in that same vein, um, 
I do remember. I do remember. Ha I do remember having a bit having a bit of an argument, and, and which is sta which is standard fare for both gamers and designers. Oh yeah, um, sure. In regards to, um, ma in regards to massive damage, and that's some. Given that that's something that isn't really tackled in f in Five E, I'm guessing that um, D Twenty Modern's version of massive damage isn't going to be in everyday heroes. Right. Yeah, we're using the Five E standard, which is if you take if you're brought to zero by damage that is equal to your hit points, you die. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't happen very much. I mean, it could happen. You can do a lot of damage in everyday heroes. It's it's a bit of a Compared to Dungeons and Dragons, the damage curve is a little higher, but the defenses are a little weaker. So it plays a little faster and harder, if you know what I mean. Um, so especially low-level characters could, if your game master is really brutal, take that kind of damage. Um, but once you get up to like level 10, you know, many characters could have like 100 hit points. You don't take 100 points of damage real often. It could happen, but it's not real common. Mm -hmm. um, so that rule probably won't impact often, but it is in the book. Yeah. Now, the other thing, the other thing is, it's. I may have skipped. I may have skipped this over, but it does. It does sound like you guys have, at least, at least with the with your version of advanced classes, some incarnation of ta of talents. Um, we call the powers or abilities that characters get as they level up talents. So that's just kind of our name for the stuff you get from your class, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we call those talents. Um, I think in D20 Modern, talents were sort of the the options that you pick as you go up in the core classes, right? You were to specialize all, you your were, character. Um, in both D20 Modern and Star Wars Sagas, which is the latter of which has been horribly overlooked with time, um, yeah, it's a good game. You get you, you were alternating between fe between feats and talents, and that's true here as well. Um, the The base class gives you something at every level, and at even levels, you're picking feats: two minor, one major, uh, depending on your what you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the odd levels, the classes are giving you new talents. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty similar in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, the key, the key thing for me is is making sure that I ha I have a bit of I have a bit of a threshold where if I can make if I can make two characters in the same archetype but they but they don't feel exactly the same then that's a win. Right. Uh because I've had I've had far I've had far too many cases where pe where people say. Oh, you can make just about any character with this, and while you while you can, when you get when you get down to the numbers, um, the differences aren't felt as strongly. And I know, gotcha. I, I yeah. know that the I know that you that one could easily argue, um, the nar the narrative part, but I'm of I'm of the opinion that the narrative and the mechanic part of of a given game shouldn't be, um, segregated. Yeah, I. You know, it depends. Like, mm -hmm. some classes get defined, uh, well, I usually say thematically, but that would be narratively. Mm -hmm. They get designed that way first, and others get designed mechanically first. It just kind of depends where the inspiration's coming from. Yeah. Um, you know, we try to keep the game mechanics um, mostly core, by which meaning, if you understand, you know, basically 5e and d20 itself, you roll a d20, you add an ability score modifier, you add a proficiency bonus. You check against a target number. If you're equal or higher, you succeed. If you're lower, you don't. Um, that mechanic is just kind of like a core thing. We don't mm -hmm. deviate from it very much. Uh, there's advantage and disadvantage. We've added a few things to fiddle around with damage dice. We have something called dice steps, which is like D6 to D8 to D12, etc. And then we have adding or removing dice. So you get 3D6, 4D6 you know, and back down again, just to formalize those ideas so it's easier to reference in the rules. Mm -hmm. And we use those a bit more than D&D &D to create just sort of another scale of, of dynamics. But other than that, we try not to move away from those core rules because we want it to be accessible to new players. Yeah. But I try to be really creative. I'm, 
you know, of the two of the designers, uh, Goober is a little better at going, well, this is how 5e does it. And like, this is why. And I'm a little bit more, but yeah, but what if we did this, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, and try to push the boundaries a little bit. So and we've got a bit of both in the game, but we, we don't want to make it hard for players if they're new players. And yet at the same time, I want there to be depth that experienced players can use to express their cleverness, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Now, on the Kickstarter page, you talk about making a better chase system. And while it is true that a lot of chase systems are tr- are tricky to work with, especially if you have grid combat, um, how do you how are you guys planning on ta- on tackling chases? Because right now the gold standard for chases for me has been Spycraft. Yeah, and I like Spycraft a lot. Um, although I do find their chase system a little complicated for my tastes, right? Um, uh, but it is very good. I, I just I love Spycraft. I love the production on the book. I love the design. I love the style. It's a great game. Well, um, I should I should clarify Spycraft 2.0. 1.0 was not ba- not bad, but it w- but it was very much D20 with a slightly different coat of paint. Uh, you know, I might not have seen Spycraft 2.0. I have the the D20 version since we're a D20 they're game. They're both they're both yeah. D- they're both D20. It's just that um Spy- the original Spycraft felt more like a D20 campaign setting instead of instead of its own thing. 2.0 was where they really started to branch out in their, into their own style using the D20 system. Oh, okay. You know, I'm not sure which one I have then, <laughs> but uh, I'll check. Is it a is, okay? Anyway, it, <laughs> is it a gray book? If it's a gray book, it's 2.0. It's gray. Yes, then absolutely. That, yeah, that's 2.0. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. I love this book. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> it's also I a it's thick super, boy. Super cool. Yeah, but, it's pretty good. Get, but getting to that, how do you pl- how do you plan on handling Chase? Because it's kind of hard to do a Hollywood style genre emulation without doing a Chase system. Yeah, absolutely. Like that was one of Dave's things: is like, it's got to have a Chase system. And you know, when he was uh, pick- getting designers, what he did, uh, he got some advice from someone who who declined to, to be a designer and said, well, what you should do, go to DM's Guild, look for somebody doing chase mechanics for 5e, and if it gets really good reviews, hire them. And that's what he did. So he got um, my co-designer Goober to, to come in. Uh, and Goober likes to be called Goober, by the way, which surprised me at first, but so that's what I do since that's what they request. Um, so Goober made a chase mechanic called Better Chases or something like that. And so he was the guy in charge of making chases, right? So Goober dove into that and came up with our system. However, chases are really difficult. And so we all collaborated and tested the system and you know complained about the things we didn't like and sat around trying to think of how to make it better. Mm-hmm. And so we've got what we got at the end. We, we did finalize it, but that was also a system up to the last minute. We were tweaking, trying to improve it, trying to make it better. Um, and I think it's quite good. Whether I don't know that everyone will like it because I think it's an unusual thing. There isn't sort of a gold standard for chases, really. And everybody's gotten a different opinion whether they want it to be fast and breezy or detailed and tactical, right? Ours is more on the fast and breezy side, I'll say. Mm-hmm. So let me, yeah, let me give you an outline of how it works. So when you get into a chase in our game, it follows a similar pattern as combat. So we used as much of that structure. So there are rounds and turns, right? Um, and there's an initiative order that you're going to do things in. Each round of a chase, um, you're going to have something called a complication. And the complication has a little stat block, basically. And it, they, are, they come in two kinds, hazards and opportunities. A hazard is like something dangerous is happening in the environment and you need to watch out for it. An opportunity is this is a situation where you can use your athletic skill or your intelligence or some aspect of your hero in order to get an edge over your opponent, either close ground or distance ground, depending whether you're predator or prey. We did take that from Spycraft because like that is the best name for the two sides in a chase. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we also have races, by the way, which use the same mechanics, but just divide things. There's no predator or prey. Everybody's the same. They're racing instead of chasing, but mm-hmm. the mechanics are very similar. Um, okay, so you've got predator and prey. You've got your 
um, your complication that comes up at the beginning of the round. Everyone kind of has to declare how they're going to deal with it. The complication will give a check. It's like everyone needs to make a dexterity save against the landslide, or uh, everybody is going to make an endurance check on the straightaway to see you know how much gas you've got going. Uh, it's a little different for vehicles. That there's different complications with different kinds of checks, right? Because mm -hmm. we have a vehicle system as well. Um, so, so that happens. Then everybody gets a turn during the during that round of chase. In and the the complication also is sort of setting the stage. It's heavy traffic. There's a fruit cart. Um, there you're running across the rooftops. Like it's a setting, and it's a kind of a built-in challenge to the setting. Mm -hmm. Then the players uh, get to take their action. You could shoot at people. You there's some limitations. Like normally, you can't make melee attacks. Otherwise, well, you caught them already, right? Mm -hmm. But the rules say, look, if if the game master decides melee attacks are possible, then they're possible, right? But by default, they wouldn't be. Um, and so there's a, a few limitations. But otherwise, you can do many of the same things you could do in a combat round if you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, except again, there are specials because like you're all running, right? If you're at a foot chase mm -hmm. or you're all sitting in a vehicle. So movement rules really are just kind of thrown out and, and abilities that deal with movement have different effects inside of a chase. And that's kind of detailed how you adjudicate that mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, but there are a couple special actions. One of them is called um, brace. And if you brace, basically you get an advantage on the next complication. So you're scanning your environment, you're being very aware, and so you'll get advantage the next time you have to make a check on mm -hmm. the complication. Mm -hmm. um, the other is called gain ground. And so it's an action to try and get an edge in the chase, either by harrying your opponents or giving yourself some kind of advantage that they don't have, doing something clever in the environment they didn't think of. Um, now, that mechanic plus the uh, environmental mechanic, the challenge, uh, let you score chase points, basically. So the predator and prey have chase points. They start with zero. And when you succeed at these things, you gain chase points. And if you fail at them, you give the other side chase points. And so the way chases we recommend they work by default is you pick a number of rounds that will happen in the chase, we found four feels about right for most chases. Um, so there'll be four different environments that you're going to play in on each round. At the end of round four, whoever, whatever side has the most chase points wins the chase. And then there's, you know, depending on the situation, this is how you resolve the end of a chase. Um, so you're going through the environment and, you know, if it's a foot race and the predators win at the end of round four, then the game master would narrate, you know, they come to a dead end or everyone's exhausted on the other team, or, you know, they can decide kind of what the situation is, but basically the upshot is you lost the chase and you got caught or you, or the other guys escaped. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We give the game master a lot of tools in the game master section to do chases in various different ways. Cause there's all kinds of possibilities and different ways you want the outcome to happen. So if the Predators win, maybe you go into a combat now, right? Um, or maybe the other guys surrender if the Game Master doesn't want to run a combat at the end of the chase. Um, and there's uh, stuff about what happens when people drop out of a chase. So three guys are being chased. One of them, you know, gets killed or caught by a trap or something. What happens then? Mm -hmm. And so we try to give the Game Master, we try to think of all the possibilities we can come up with and through, you know, through our playtesting, things that happen during a chase, and give good guidance as to how to handle that. Because this is a very narrative game system. It's not all mechanics. Like, mm -hmm. there's that mechanics there, and you can run it purely mechanically. You can just make the die rolls and tally up your chase points, right? So if you like that, that's great. But we envision a lot more narration happening, sort of building on all these rules. And so we try to help the game master with this process because not a lot of people are used to running a chase scene right from it doesn't happen much in D, &D right so we want to give a lot of guidance and we have tables of these complications and we say hey you can you know for it's a if you're designing an adventure you're probably going to decide ahead of time what sort of scenes are going to happen during the chase what kind of obstacles people face and so you can do that but if you know a chase comes up in the middle of your game because you know, the bad guys or the characters are running away and you want them to get caught well now a chase is happening and didn't plan it well we've got tables so there's a table for street chases there's a table for vehicle street there's a table for running through the woods there's a table for running across the rooftops 
we've got these tables of complications. And if you want, you can just roll a D10 or you can just look at the table and pick one that sounds like fun. Um, and that's all in the game master section. So, uh, so that you can run these in a variety of ways. Mm-hmm. I think that's like almost everything there is to know about chases. Yeah. Now with that, in, with that in mind, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about the cinematic adventures, which is one of the, th- one of the things I've seen bandied about with, how the, with how Everyday Heroes has been covered elsewhere? Yeah, because so it's pretty unusual. Well, this is this is one of it's one of those. Um, there's no there's no way we could get away with this kind of th- kind of things. Um, mm, for the what do you mean? for the long, for the longest time, and the idea of of adapting various films into into the into this tabletop form, people have certainly done, and there's plenty of XPs that you can find. But actually, having the names for the for these is was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, and it was meant to be a surprise, right? Like this was kind of I, I did early interviews, and I'm like, okay, everybody, we've got the secret thing, like the secret sauce that I desperately want to tell you about, but I can't. So please just pay attention until we can announce it, and then like you will be surprised, right? Yeah. Uh, I had to be super vague about it because these license deals are really like hard to do um and so yeah uh <laughs> so i'm really delighted that the cat's out of the bag these days that i can talk about it yeah i um when when i was look when i was looking at when i was looking at some of that in the early in the early days of it i had i had a i had a bit of an idea of, of what was of what was going to happen but that's simply because arguably i'm too savvy for my own good um sure so as as i understand it each of these is they're not full on campaign settings but more like a mini more like a mini expansion of 100 pages each. Yeah, so Dave's initial vision, um he really loves like the old polyhedron magazine and dungeon magazine and and this idea that you could have a subscription and get a new cool setting every month or so. It's going to be six weeks, I think, the release cadence on these. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of his vision, right? That's what he really wanted to do. Um, And so to do that, you know, yeah, like a 300-page book on a setting, that's really hard to produce in that quantity, right? So we had to figure out what's the most content we can do for each of these um, and keep that kind of every year we have a set slate of these licensed products. Um, so that's how we kind of got to where we are. And we wanted to have an adventure, right? You, you want something so people can just jump right in and do it. But we also want <clears throat> rules and setting such that you can make new adventures of your own in that world, either kind of following along with the film or your own wild, totally different idea that's in the setting of the film mm-hmm. or the setting of the cinematic universe, depending on what our license is for. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, yeah, so we want all those things. And, and it's hard to do in 100 pages, but I will say this, like a lot of source books, and I'm not knocking them because it's not a bad thing, um, will spend a lot of time describing things you kind of already know, right? Like who's Luke Skywalker? Um, well, we all know who Luke Skywalker is. Is it cool to see his stats? Yeah, absolutely. Do you need like a lot of detail about the things that we already know? Not so much. So one of my philosophies is to try to do these books such that while if you're brand new to it, you still understand everything that you're seeing, but we're not going to go into detail about some of the things that you can just see in the film. Mm. Right. I'm not going to re-describe the film to you. Um, I will, you know, synopsize the plot in less than a paragraph. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But then we will get on with content for the game, you know, rules, classes, stuff for players, stuff for game masters, guidance on plots that you could create. You know, we're going to try to get creative and come up with wild ideas that you could do in the setting, suggest those to you, and give you background and lore that maybe aren't in the movies or only touched on, like, in a line of dialogue or something to build out, right, you know, so that you can watch the movie and get all that content, but then you can look at our book and you'll get more right? Not just telling you what you already saw. That's a way that we can take that sort of 50 pages of rules and setting and make it uh, richer. Mm -hmm. And then the adventure will also include background details and cool stuff as well. So kind of buried, not buried, but 
work weaved into it mm. will be cool ideas, right? Yeah. So like, let, let's take the crow, for instance. Now we're in the early stages of developing these. We had to get the core rules done first because mm -hmm. you can't supplement to something that isn't finished, right? Yeah, I don't want so, to have eyes bigger than your stomach. Right, so we had to nail that down first and it was a lot of work and, and, and we did it in a pretty short time. Um, now we're starting to work on these cinematic adventures, which is why we don't have super great details on them. But I can tell you like, things that we've been talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So like the crow, um, you know, we had to ask, so can we make other animal spirits? Could we have a wolf, which appeared in the comic books? Mm -hmm. Could we have a turtle or a whatever? And uh, we got permission to do that, right? So we will probably have some additional spirits like this uh, and some lore for them. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to add a way to like, you know, in the show, basically the spirit of the crow resurrects the the wrongful dead, the wronged dead. They come back to life. They have an emotional mission that they try to complete. And when they complete it, they lose their connection um, and uh, they, they go back to being dead again. But we thought, well, it would also be nice if some living characters, if you wanted to make, a, you know, one of the classes from Everyday Heroes had a connection to these animal spirits or had a connection to the Risen character. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to add some of that. So we're going to get creative whenever we can because the license holders get the final say on what we do mm -hmm. um and try to expand where we can because that's the spirit of role playing right like yes here's the forgotten realms but you tell your story in the forgotten realms and if you make up a character that they're in there right um so that spirit of role playing is very important to us and very important to dave uh so these won't just be by the numbers here's the movie you know, no, it's it's like, here's a setting for the movie. Of course, usually we could do more, but we have a limited space. So we're just going to make it count. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense, right? That's the plan. <laughs> yeah. And with some of with some of these, obviously, get, obviously going into the, 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 the deep, deep, the deep minutia is a little, is a little bit too far ahead, but there's a few that, there's a few that um that, that I'm curious how you guys are gonna handle. And sure, and I'll, I'll the, give you as much as the, I can. <laughs> um, so one of the big ones that one of the big ones that I knew I was gonna have I knew I was gonna ask about is how you're is how you're going to be how you guys are considering handling um Jaegers in with Pacific Rim. Yeah, it's a challenge. So. Pacific Rim, not only are we going to have this source book, uh, which, you know, the cinematic adventure, we'll likely have a full-on source book for that. We haven't announced it. We haven't promised it, mm -hmm. but we want to do it, right? It's And it's part of the licensing deal that we worked out that I think we'll have three products, right? Because it's too big a difference to completely contain in 100, like in 50 pages of rules. Yeah, we're probably going to hire another designer. I'll still, I'm still kind of the lead designer for the company to some degree, and I'll kind of oversee some stuff. But we're going to hire another designer to to work only on that project because mm -hmm. it it's going to need that kind of horsepower to to get it through. Yeah. So, um, and we have not because we're going to hire somebody. We don't want to tell them what the design is, right? We want them, we whoever we hire, we want them to be really good and to have their own vision. And to be able to come in and have that creative freedom to really make a great game. Because, hmm. um, yeah, if you tell somebody this is exactly what the design is, that you didn't need to hire a designer, right? Uh, so I don't know how we're going to do it. I have vague ideas. Now, I wrote the vehicle rules. Um, well, actually, Goober wrote the vehicle rules in the core book. Mm -hmm. But I came in towards the end. It was one of the last things we did a big revision on. And because I knew we had gotten Pacific Rim, we didn't know we got these things until maybe two months ago, right? Because the process is very complicated. Um, yeah. But once I knew we had it, I knew we had to look at the vehicle rules and make sure that these would be applicable to giant robots in some way. Like they're not written about giant robots. They're written about cars and helicopters and stuff. But if you wanted to take some of these mechanics and use them to simulate giant robots, you could do that and they would still make good sense. Um, so, uh, we did a kind of a rewrite on the vehicle rules with this in mind, uh, to try and make core mechanical principles that are extensible in scale, 
Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the thing is, like, will a Jaeger have hit points like a hero does on the same scale? And I think the answer is no. Um, and in everyday heroes, our vehicles do not have hit points. Um, they It's a little more like maybe inspired by Battletech, one of my favorite games, um, where vehicles have kind of a condition. You know how uh, in 5e there is um, uh, the exhaustion? Or in, I'm not, it's not exhaustion. It's... Um, Fatigue? No, I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's escaping. We have so many things in the game, mm -hmm. right? But anyway, they have a condition, and the condition has some tiers. And so the vehicles work a bit like this. If the engine is damaged, there's a couple tiers, and the, the the performance degrades until it's finally no longer able to operate anymore, right? And each time it gets damaged, it kind of ups a tier, and you can up two tiers at once for in some conditions, etc. Right? And it's also possible just for a vehicle to just get exploded. It takes enough damage, boom, it fails a saving throw, and it's just out of commission. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying the Jaegers will work like that, but I did design those mechanics. So if that designer wants to use those, and hopefully they use at least some elements of it, uh, you can do it. But they're going to be on a, a different scale, right? So yeah. a guy with a machine gun is not going to do anything to a Jaeger. That's just right out. And we already have some of that baked in with our armor system and stuff. But um, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure exactly. I'm hoping it's very, it has a very strong tactical element to it. Because mm -hmm. um, I love giant robot battles. And I want them to have some tactics available, right? But we'll see. Um, yeah. Um, when it comes, and the fun... First off, since you mentioned Battletech, I find it funny that we're doing this in doing this interview one day after the anniversary of Two Kid. Never forget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and well, I hope to I hope to God the I hope to God you're not a you're not a capellan. No, I mean I'll be honest. <laughs> I was more into Battletech for the strategy than the lore, so I'm not a lore expert on Battletech. But I played the hell out of the game. My first programming experience was making databases for my battle mechs to design new mechs. Right? Yeah. So that's how I got into software engineering. Um, so that, that game's pretty near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. But I was a munchkin rather than a, a lore guy. I'm I'm a little I'm a little of both. Even though even though the, even though there are certain memes that I will em, that I will embrace. Um I'll always pick on clanners for being for being weird and smug and and love the urban mech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. I had a I had a miniature. Oh god, we're gonna get geeky for a sec here. Super geeky. As I had we a haven't Mando already. miniature, and I I the commando is very human form shaped robot, mm -hmm. and I painted him like he had a business suit on, and that was my urban mech. But, <laughs> but with the the reason what the reason why um I wanted to specifically focus on Pacific Rim is with a lot of the with a lot of the others I can easily visualize. The at the add-ons that that cinematic adventure book would put in, but with something like Pacific Rim, you have two major obstacles. One is figuring out how figuring out how to handle um, mechs, and mm -hmm. two how to handle the thing that's unique when it comes to Jaegers, the whole the whole dual pilot setup. Yeah, the drift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a big challenge. We've talked about that a lot um, because. Um, Goober is a big Pacific Rim fan, and so he's very adamant about, like, you know, the drift is super important. It's part of the emotional story. It needs to be represented in the mechanics. Um, other people are like, yeah, but people are just going to want to pilot things by themselves, you know. So we've had a lot of discussions about that. No, no decision has been made. But mm -hmm. it's definitely, like, really important to our design team, for me, that we stay true to the movie, Right and the and the property, so that when you play our game, the elements that are key to the movie are represented in the game. But we also need to make it a fun game to play and accessible. So if you want to play Pacific Rim by yourself, like one on one with a, a game master, well, we want you to be able to do that. So we'll figure out a way that that can work. But it has to stay true to the lore of the film. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll recommend ideally, yeah, you know, here's how the drift works. Here's why it's important to the story. Um, here's how a game master can work with that to tell really cool stories in this world. Um, and here's how the mechanics give you that feeling, right? Um, uh, you know, we haven't made a decision yet. We've just talked about it a lot. Yeah. And 
in that sa in that same vein, when it comes to when it comes to Highlander, um, I'm guessing you guys have had discussions on how on how to how to ha how to handle Im how to handle immortals so that there's still a degree of threat because it can be easily yeah. argued that the lack of or the lack of a risk of death or the, or serious consequences on that level with immortals can make could make things too easy. Yeah, it's so I think there's there's two challenges here. One one is representing it in the mechanics in a way that balances encounters, right? And the other is storytelling um and the the threats <clears throat> that the game master poses because normal D and D and normal everyday heroes. One of the threats is that you will die, right? And that your story will be over. Mm -hmm. um, and while that can still happen in Highlander, it happens only under fairly extreme conditions. So it is. And that's true of the crow as well, by the way, because in, in the crow movie, um, the crow is essentially unkillable. You can't even cut off their head, right? Like they just don't die. They're already dead. So you can't kill them. Um, and this leads to those two kinds of challenges. On the mechanic side, it's actually easier in a way than you might expect because the way Dungeons and Dragons abstracts hit points, um, the way the D20 system generally works, hit points can have a different meaning in a different story, right? So in Everyday Heroes, it doesn't make sense you get shot 10 times with a gun and you're just like, yeah, that's fine, right? Like I'm fighting at full power. I got 10, 10 bullets in me, who cares? So we advise the game master to thematically say that hit points are also your fighting spirit, your endurance, um, and a number of things. And so if you get hit with a gun, the game master has the freedom to say, yes, you actually, a bullet struck your flesh and went into your body, or it grazed right by your ear and scared the heck out of you because that could have been the end, right? And mm -hmm. it's taken away a little of your, your go, right? Uh, usually the one that drops you to zero is probably going to be very physical, right? But uh, the other ones might not be, or maybe it hit, you know, your bulletproof vest or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so narratively, hit points can do a lot of things. If you're playing Highlander or Crow, you can go crazy with the full-on blood, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, he took a sword through the gut. He's still got hit points left because he's, he's an immortal, right? Mm -hmm. um, so narratively, you can kind of deal with that. Um, and, you know, high, uh, not Highlanders, immortals can be dropped, right? Uh, in the TV show... Yeah, you can beat them up like they, they're going to get back up again, but they are defeated. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you run out of hit points as an immortal, you still fall down. You're not going to make death saving throws because that's not going to kill you. Right. But you have been beaten up and now you're pretty vulnerable to somebody cutting your head off. Right. That's how the movie works. Um, and so that's how the game will work. So mechanically, it's actually not as hard as you might imagine to balance an encounter that way, because hit points are such a flexible mechanic from a narrative standpoint. Mm -hmm. um however in a story it's very different right because the tension in a lot of heroic stories comes from the hero could die right it, they're on a tall building on a cliff da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. that's not the case in a highlander story they're not gonna die um it, except for a bad guy killing them very intentionally so you need the dramatic tension to be more focused on can they achieve their mission Right? Can they save the other people? Can they avoid detection? Can they, you know, uh, do whatever it is that the goal of the adventure or the goal of the player is? Uh, and so, as a game master and as a storyteller, you've got to think a little differently than your classic Dungeons and Dragons adventure, where death is kind of the only consequence. Right? Mm -hmm. You're risking your life to get the treasure. Is the classic D and D story. Yeah. Now, Everyday Heroes, a modern story, is a little more like, can you save the world? Can you do the heroic thing? Mm. And that, But Highlander and, say, Crow have got to be 100% that because the threat of death is not going to create tension in the story. Mm -hmm. We'll give the Game Master guidance. That's really a storyteller Game Master side. But our books are both mechanics and guidance for play. Right. Yeah. And both of those parts are really important to us. And so, yeah, you'll definitely see a good section in Highlander and Crow about playing with immortal characters and, and how to keep that really exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's, it's fun to, to 
roll in and be an immortal character, right? You could do some crazy stuff. And that happens in the films and movies, and we want that to be part of the story. So we'll also tell the Game Master, hey, don't try to make them feel just like a regular character, because they're not. They need to feel sometimes like being unkillable is awesome. Because uh, why else would you play it, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for Everyday Heroes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I was told by Dave when it came to the core rule book, don't worry about it. Like that's unusual. Uh, that's not been true on any other project I've worked on. <laughs> so he's just like, Ur. I don't want the game to feel like it has a bunch of filler. Right. So I tried not to write a bunch of, you know, just pad it out. I do get paid by the word generally, um, but I don't want to pad things out. And we cut pretty mercilessly at the end there, you know, like, ah, you know what, this doesn't really serve the game. Get it out. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a whole big thing about how criminal gangs work and stuff to help people tell stories related to like cocaine dealers since that's such a common trope. But in the end, it didn't have a place in the book. So it got cut. It'll probably show up again in one of our adventures or something. But um, so no fluff. Um, well, no, we have fluff. No extra stuff you don't need, hopefully. Um, but lots and lots of material. Uh, so we, have, we were not given a limit. All right. We've got so many NPCs. There's more than 100 feats. We've got more than 20 backgrounds and more than 20 professions. We got, hopefully, if all the Kickstarters hit uh, goals, uh, 20 classes. There's a lot of material in there. It'll be a pretty big book. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the page count until we do the layout, right? So much depends. The, in, in Google Docs, which is what I use to develop the, the text, uh, we've got about 500 pages for the core book. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in the range of, I think, 170,000 words, something in that that ballpark um so it's pretty big all right oh and with that in mind what are you shooting for as far as a release window not a date but just a general ballpark yeah so the the core rule book uh printed version should be available beginning 2023 um so first quarter is kind of the goal mm -hmm. um as early as possible is what we're shooting for but we think that's what's possible right uh right now the core rules have gone to our editing team so we've finished development and design uh editing is gonna comb over it make sure all the language is uniform make sure everything is you know take out any superfluous language that uh, goober and i may have included uh and just really sharpen that thing and we have a really master level editor um, who worked on D20 Modern and has been in the gaming business forever. So she understands games and does an amazing job. So it should be really sharp when it's done. Uh, then it'll go to layout. Uh, and then at that point, once layout's finished, then the PDF can come out uh, and we send the PDF to the printer. I believe the the if you buy both the electronic and the hardcover, I believe you get the electronic first. But that's not my department, really. It's just, but it'll be done the PDFs will be done before the hardcover book. That's definitely going to be the case with the cinematic adventures. They will come out in electronic format first, and then later a printed version will be available. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you buy that, you can opt to add the printed version. We didn't have that planned at first, but everyone's like, no, I want a print version of the Highlander thing. And we're like, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Like, we'll right. find somebody to print it, right? Um, so, but they, they will have a, a later cadence because it's just how it works. Like you have to have the PDF to send to the printer. So you've got, you always have the electronic version well before the printed version. Um, some games will just put them out at the same time. We kind of want to get it in people's hands as soon as possible. So mm -hmm. we will do it in that order. But ultimately those decisions are for Dave, right? I've just kind of based on what I know is going on, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me, sir. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And... Of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay 
fucking frosty, everybody.